When I was about 10 years old, my father said, Derek, there are three things in life as you walk through this journey that are going to make you stand out. He said, number one, the shoes that you wear. Can everybody take a look at their shoes and tell me where you are on this journey in life? Second thing, he said, the watch that you wear on your wrist. And the third thing, <laughs> which has nothing to do with my talk, he said, the pajamas that you wear in bed. But that's a talk for another day. <laughs> my father, early on in life, told me about the importance of how you visually look, your first impression. And today, I'm going to talk to you about the science of first impressions and how important they are in our day-to-day -day lives. You know, if you fast forward 20-something odd years later, I now work with professionals, helping them to be seen for the right reasons, helping them with their image, helping them in terms of how they communicate, how they communicate not just in terms of speaking, but visually. So my name is Derek Banger, and some people say I'm an image consultant, but I'd like to think I'm a little bit more than that. If I show you a picture of that gentleman there, what do you think he does? What is your first impression of that man? Right. Yeah, fog, all of that. He's actually, <laughs> he's actually a Harvard graduate. Here's another picture. What do you think that lady does? What's your first impression? What does she do? Teacher, maybe works in a salon, doing nails or hair. She's also a, uh, a graduate of a major university. There's another picture. What do you think that gentleman does? <laughs> Student? Possibly? He's actually a multi-millionaire, having created many apps that you and I use every day on our smartphones. So, our first impression is right. Do we go on with our first impressions that we have? Robert Caldini, who's a famous professor, he's a motivational speaker and an author as well, in this seminal book about influence, talked about how the brain works. You know, the brain is a remarkable organ. It is the smartest organ in our body, but it is also the laziest. It's smart, why? I mean, just look around us. The fact that how we have evolved as human beings and the fact that we're living in a new millennia with all these wonderful technological advances that have made our lives so much easier. That's the power of the brain. But the brain, when I say it's lazy, also makes decisions not only very quickly, but very easy. I mean, think about milk that has spilt on the ground, right? If you spill some milk on the ground and maybe it's cobbled or there's cracks of paper, the milk looks for the easiest path to flow. That's what the brain is doing when it meets somebody or something for the first time. It's looking for an easy way to make a quick decision. Now, some people have argued that this is to help us propagate the species. In other words, is that person who we're meeting friend or foe? But I would argue that the brain is actually just trying to make our lives easier. Put us in categories of yes, maybe, or no. And you know it. You meet somebody. And instinctively, something tells you that this person is competent, honest, relevant, sophisticated. I mean, all these values are associated with a particular person when we meet them in the first few seconds. That's the brain. I want you to turn around to your neighbor and just ask them, what did you think of me when you first met me? <laughs> and that's a rhetorical question which you'll answer later because I have a time limit that I'm under. Yes, no, or maybe. Yes, I'll do business with you. 
Maybe I'll do business with you. Oh no, I don't think I'll do business with you. And here's the thing, human beings are unfailingly polite. So even if our instinct is to say, I don't trust you, I don't believe you, I don't like you, very often our social norms, the way we are culturally brought up, and we'll say, you know, yeah, I'll give you a chance. I'll go out on a second date with you. Even though you're saying to yourself, there is no way <laughs> on God's green earth that you and I are ever going to have a long-term relationship. Caldini also talks about this thing called the halo effect. The halo effect, where certain qualities are given to a person when we meet them, based on that visual impression that they give us, but additional, additional qualities. So somebody might come across as perhaps very smart, visually, you like the way they look, and then, in addition to that, you will also think this person is honest, this person is competent. In fact, many relationships are built on this. <laughs> we know that there is something, perhaps, not wrong, but there's a problem with our partner. But because that first impression, we found them, perhaps, very attractive. That overrides everything else that tells us that there may be something wrong with this particular person. And instead we look at them as this is the most brilliant, honest, truthful, trustworthy person. Another professor by the name of Merabian talked about the visual image being 55% of our judging people. We, are, we meet somebody and 55% is simply based on what we see. Body language, dress, nonverbal communication. So, in Paris, Paris is in the news obviously for the wrong reasons today, but in Paris, about a year and a half ago, some people decided to do this experiment. At the same spot, two men, actors, one of them dressed in a business suit, pretended to have a heart attack and collapse. Guess what? In seconds, people rushed to his aid. Are you okay? Is everything, you know, is everything fine? Another actor, dressed up as a homeless person, same scenario, pretending to have a heart attack, collapses. And this is a very famous YouTube video. Ten minutes before anybody bothers to find out what is wrong with this person. Visually, we are making impressions, or people are making impressions on us, based on what we see. So, that's the Mona Lisa, iconic painting. If you were to look, and the great thing about this painting is that it doesn't matter at what angle you look at it for, the eyes follow you. But there is something called the Mona Lisa effect. If I was to that painting, can anyone tell me what was the color of her dress? Or what was the color of the background behind her? You see, Mona Lisa has created such a pervasive overall impression on us that even the details are lost. It's the power of first impressions. At Princeton University, they did a study. They flashed these computer-generated images, and some of the images had the mouth turned down. Some were in a neutral position, and some were turned up. And they flashed them very quickly. And the study came back, and it showed that people consider those whose neutral expression, where the mouth is turned up, to be more trustworthy. What is, I call it your resting position. What is your resting position? Is your mouth turned down? Is it turned up? The same university did a study where they flashed quickly images of candidates running for political office. Just two seconds flashing those images. And obviously whether they would vote for them or not. So they knew nothing about these candidates, they just saw images. Over 76% of the people who were in this study chose the same candidate simply based on what our brain even subconsciously was taking. And it could have been the nonverbal. Maybe how the eyebrows were shaped. Maybe that distance between the nose and the brow. The power of visual impressions. So, that's a beautiful woman. I think we can all agree on that, right? Let's talk a little bit more about this thing called the beauty principle. What is this? You know, the beauty principle doesn't kick in when you become famous and win an Oscar award. <laughs> Even as babies, as babies, 
Babies that are more attractive get cuddled more, touched more, spoken to with that sort of cooing voice more. In fact, another interesting study was done. They took two babies, one considered attractive and one not so attractive, and they let them loose in the supermarket. Do you know that the babies who are more attractive were picked up or held quicker than the babies who are less attractive? In other words, the less attractive babies is okay. Let that five pound <laughs> box fall on you. So even as babies, this sort of beauty principle or premium is kicking in. In school, primary school, high school, even when we go to graduate, more attractive students, better marks. More attractive students, you turn in your homework late, you can perhaps get away with your explanation of why your homework is late. There's an advantage. Relationships. <laughs> Do you know, they found out that if you bring two people together with similar interests and similar personalities, it doesn't matter whether they have those interests. The reason that these couples would stay together overwhelmingly was found out to be if they found each other attractive. The minute you don't find your partner attractive, that relationship is, is foundering. It's not just about personality and interest. Okay, so I'm talking about beauty and you're probably wondering where do the men come in. Do you know, the average height of men around the world is five foot nine inches. The average height of men who are in leadership positions, general of an army, president of a country, you know, principal of a university, is six feet, a whole two inches taller. Why do taller men ascend to positions of leadership? Do they work harder? Are they smarter? No. They're considered ladies more attractive. I think you want to look up to your man, not look down to him and say, how are you doing, honey? <laughs> right? So we come to the workplace. Do you know, studies have shown that women who wear makeup at work earn bigger salaries, get promoted more often. They have more professional success. In fact, across the board, people who are more attractive earn 10 to 15% more money. Think about that over a lifetime of your salary, the more attractive you are. <laughs> Defendants in court. The less attractive you are, the harsher the sentence. And the reverse is obviously true. The more attractive you are, the lighter the sentence. Even plaintiffs who are bringing a civil case, if you are more attractive, you get awarded more money over and over again. In every aspect of our lives, we find this beauty premium kicking in. Even in the movies, the hero is always good looking, tall, handsome. And this is an animated feature. Simba, who's the hero in the movie, good-looking lion. Scar, who is the anti-hero. I mean, look how they've painted his face. Heroes look better. Villains always have some sort of deficiency. So, what am I saying? <laughs> is there a downside to being attractive? I mean, is it all about looks? Is it, do we live in a really superficial world? Well, there may be a few things that I haven't pointed out. Obviously, there's a point about people thinking that you got the position or the job or the project simply because of how good you look and not how competent you are. Okay? That brings in feelings of jealousy. Okay? In fact, even doctors will diagnose good-looking patients differently. They will think there's nothing wrong with them. You can't be that good-looking and have a problem. Cancer is not in your... Seriously. <laughs> and, yes... You know, good looking, perhaps less approachable. Here's how I want to conclude my talk. We're all wonderfully and fearfully created. And it doesn't matter how sharp your cheekbones are, or how strapping or tall you are, the one thing that makes people attractive is one word and it begins with E. And going through life like this, whether it's work, whether it's school, and that is enthusiasm. Enthusiasm. Can you turn around to your neighbor and just tell them you're the most beautiful person in the world with enthusiasm? And watch how good looking they will become if they're not already there. 
enthusiasm, enjoyment, and energy in life. Thank you very much.